Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm gonna be your ranter and raconteur. I'm gonna be talking about things that are important to me and that I think are worthy of your intention, should be important to you as well. Uh, as always, if you have any reactions to the show, comments, questions, whatever, you can contact me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my uh, website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up over here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And you can just do a search on that. It'll come up. You can go there and get the, uh, get the email address directly from there. Uh, and I confess that I am, again, not always the fastest about responding to emails, but I do answer them. You, you will get an answer. Oh, I'd also ask that if you do send me email about the show, say something about your show or left side of the aisle or something like that so that I can see it's not spam, which I get too much of. All right, a couple of things to get through today. Uh, we'll see how far I get in this list. Uh, but uh, I want to start with a bit of good news. I always like to start with good news where I can. It's rare enough that I can. The, the Obama administration has announced that it is going to use uh, foreign aid, U.S. foreign aid, uh, as a means to help promote the rights of gays and lesbians abroad. That is, how they are treated is going to be one of the criteria in judging foreign aid. Uh, they also want to use this to um, oppose foreign governments that criminalize homosexuality or like in the case of Uganda, want to make it a capital offense to be gay. Uh, they also ordered uh, agencies to, um, uh, to protect gays and lesbians, at-risk gays and lesbians who are um, refugees or asylum seekers. And that, that last part actually uh, I especially was pleased about because there have been a number of cases where uh, a person's application for asylum in the U.S. based on a credible fear that they would be discriminated against at home because of their sexuality has been found not a valid basis for asylum. So I'm glad of that last part. This, uh, this action comes at a time when there is an increasing acceptance of same-sex couples, of same-sex uh, um, arrangements that, for example, the number of people who describe themselves as living in same-sex households has increased by 80% over the last 10 years. And um, support for same-sex marriage, according to polls, is actually going up year after year. Uh, in fact, this year, 2011, there were at least three major polls that uh, found majority support for recognition of same-sex marriage. There was a CNN opinion research poll, which uh, found a majority 51 to 47 in April. A Gallup poll had it 53 to 45 in May. And an ABC News Washington Post poll had it 51 to 45 in July. Two others this year also reported basically even splits on the question. Uh, Quinnipiac poll had it uh, 46 to 48 opposition, but basically a split. That was in July. But uh, that same poll also had a heavy majority of people, 59 to 35 percent, a heavy majority of people saying that the laws that ban um, federal benefits to legal same-sex couples should be abandoned. Uh, and also uh, in November, just last month, Pew Research came out with their own poll. They said it was 46 to 44 in favor of recognition of same-sex marriage. Again, basically an even split. But they noted that the support in their poll, the support for same-sex marriage, had increased nine percentage points in two years. And the other thing, if you look at the internals of the poll, the details of it, uh, you discover that um, all age groups, in all age groups, the support for same-sex marriage is going up. But the younger, the, the younger you are, the higher it is. Whereas for, for the oldest group, basically my group, uh, only about 33% supported same-sex marriage. By the time you got to the youngest group, which is like 18 to 25, something like that, it's 59%. This is coming. Equality on this, on this score is coming. And those of you out there who are still screaming no and digging your feet into the sand, you're like King Canute in the classic tale, commanding the tide to not come in. 
All right, moving on from there. Uh, over two months ago, back in September 28th it was, I talked to you about the financial crisis facing the U.S. Postal Service. Now, the crisis is very real. They've been running red ink. There's a big deficit. It's a very real crisis. But the Postal Service now has sort of formalized uh, the actions it intends to take to address this deficit. And the actions it's going to take are basically the same as what was suggested two months ago. They want to cut services and fire workers. Uh, they want to end Saturday delivery. They want to close half of the mail processing centers in the United States. Uh, they want to close nearly 4,000 local post offices and lay off over 100,000 workers. Now, even on a pure capitalist notion, this, the logic of this escapes me how you're going to uh, preserve your business by offering less and worse service. Because everyone agrees that will be the result. Well, apparently now economists are also expressing that same idea. Um, they say that uh, this may produce short-term relief, but in the long term it's going to be counterproductive because it will slow everything from oh, good heavens, from paying bills, from getting bills out, uh, to things like um, catalog sales, to, um, to outfits like Netflix is going to be affected. It'll add costs to mail order prescription drugs. It'll add anything time sensitive, like magazines or newspapers or appeals from nonprofits or, uh, or candidate and, and other uh, election information as election time rolls around. They can all be affected by this. Now, the Postal Service is an independent agency of the federal government. It's a federal agency, but it gets no tax money. It gets no fund from Congress, not a penny. Um, however, at the same time, it is subject to congressional approval for significant parts of its operations. Uh, that is not just um, uh, the kind of regulations for health and safety and so on that any business might expect to be subjected to and should be subjected to, but actual about the actual operations of the Postal Service. Uh, the proposals, by the way, that they're making do not require that approval. It's one of the reasons they're making them. Well, in 2006, Congress passed the uh, Postal Accountability Enhancement Act. One of the things this act did is it required the Postal Service to set aside enough money to fully fund future retiree health benefits out to 75 years in the future. And they had to establish this fund within 10 years. So that's costing the Postal Service $5.5 billion a year. Um, the thing is, in other words, what the Congress was doing, it was demanding of the Postal Service that it be prepared to fully fund the retiree health benefits of future workers who hadn't even been born yet. And this is costing them five and a half billion dollars a year. And what's more, it's recently, it was also recently found that the Postal Service has been overpaying into its employee pension fund. In fact, there's somewhere between 50 and 75 billion dollars that does not have to be there. Uh, if the Postal Service could take that excess from the pension fund and put it into the health care fund, it would save the Postal Service that five and a half billion dollars a year, which is nearly double the amount that all of these cutbacks are supposed to save. But that, unfortunately, requires the approval of Congress and the lizard brains in charge there don't seem in any mood to give that kind of authority. In fact, Daryl Issa who chairs the House Oversight Committee. He called a proposal to shift funds a bailout, even though it doesn't use any public money at all. Instead, he introduced a bill to create an emergency oversight committee that would have the authority to go to the Postal Service, slash services, and more importantly, tear up the union contract. Now, why? Why refuse to allow the agency to simply take money from one fund where it's not needed and deposit in another fund where it is? Why? Well, there's two reasons, one of which I just sort of touched on, the union. The Postal Service has a strong union. It's one of the few remaining strong unions in the United States. And the right wing would love to break this union and see this as an opportunity. The other reason is that the Postal Service is a public service and it does its job well. 
It does it efficiently, it does it cheaply. And if you think it's not cheap, you tell me what else you can get for 44 cents today. About the only thing that the right wing hates more than taxes on the rich and regulations on corporations is public services, government services that work. And they'll be glad of taking any opportunity they can find in order to undermine them. All right, going on to uh, an even bigger outrage. Uh, last Tuesday, a week ago, the Senate voted to pass its version of the National Defense Authorization Act. This is the bill that empowers the, uh, uh, authorizes the spending of money on the military, on our wars, and the rest of that. This bill includes a provision to let the military detain terrorism suspects on U.S. soil indefinitely without trial. This measure was crafted in secret by Senators um, Carl Levin and John McCain. It was passed in a closed-door committee session uh, with no hearings. More specifically, what this uh, provision does is it empowers Barack Obama and every future president to order the military to seize civilians anywhere in the world and hold them indefinitely without trial until the end of hostilities, the end of the war on terror, which we've already been told is going to be generations long. Basically, in, in, uh, confine them without trial, without charge, for life. This would apply even to U.S. citizens, even to U.S. citizens within the bounds of the United States. The only thing that's required is a hearing where the government says you are a suspected terrorist. That's all that's required. This is Guantanamo Bay imported to the U.S. This is Bagram imported to the United States. This is authorization for the White House and the military to disappear American citizens. And if you don't know what it means to disappear someone, look it up. The director of the FBI is against this. The director of national intelligence is against this. The secretary of defense is against this. The um, uh, attorney general is against this. The White House regards this as so serious that Obama has threatened to veto the entire National Defense Authorization Act because of it. The Senate twice rejected attempts to soften the impact of this. Uh, Mark Udall proposed an amendment that would have stripped that language out of the bill. It was rejected by 38 to 60, that is 38 for this amendment, 60 against it, with 15 Democrats joining and saying no, that is rejecting the amendment. Dianne Feinstein had an amendment which would specifically limit the uh, uh, detention to people taken abroad, that is at least it would not apply within the borders of the United States. That was rejected 45 to 55 with 10 Democrats voting no. The only thing the sane minority here was able to get was this meaningless, vapid reference to the bill uh, saying it does not change existing law, even as Levin and McCain and other people were saying that this is existing law. In fact, Lindsey Graham, in the course of debating the Udall Amendment, Lindsey Graham said, and I'm quoting him here, the enemy is all over the world, here at home. They should not be read their Miranda rights. They should not be given a lawyer. They should be held in military custody and interrogated about why they joined Al-Qaeda and what they intend to do to all the rest of us. In other words, for him, suspicion equals proof and accusation equals conviction. A senior uh, Republican aide said that this was bipartisan on both sides. Uh, he said... Everybody's trying to do the right thing. It's just a difference of opinion. Well, that is crap. This is not a difference of opinion. This is a difference between those who want to maintain at least some sense of who we are supposed to be as a people and a bunch of sniveling cowards going all wobbly at the knees at the very word terrorist, indeed at the very word suspected, who are prepared to sacrifice some of the most basic legal 
premises, some of the most basic constitutional protections that makes us what we are, who would rather, they're a bunch of whiny crybabies running for the protection of mommy's skirts because they're prepared to have everybody else pay the price because they don't imagine any of this ever happening to them. They don't imagine that they'll ever be disappeared. It's only other people. Anyone who voted for this, that is, by what you mean, anyone who voted against either of these amendments is despicable. I don't care if you're a liberal or a conservative. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. If you voted against these, you disgust me. And actually, I actually have to stop talking about this because I can't stay calm and continue to talk about this. I just, it is so outrageous. There is one bit of good news here. Uh, the House version, which has already passed, did not contain this provision. So the bill has to go to conference. Maybe the provision will be stripped out in conference. Um, if it's not, Barack Obama better come through with that veto threat. Okay, something else now. Occupy. Uh, can't, can't a little week go by without some Occupy news. Um, the empire continues to strike back. Wave, the wave of forcible shutdowns that started a few weeks ago continues. Occupy Hartford was just shut down because the mayor referred to reports of illegal activity. Occupy Seattle has been given 72 hours to clear out uh, before, before they will be forced out for health and safety issues. Uh, overnight, Tuesday night, overnight, Occupied San Francisco was raided by police. They were forced out, arrested on five minutes notice. Occupy or uh, Orlando, Orlando, Florida was kicked out. At least, uh, at least they didn't do it in the middle of the night. But the thing is, they cited unspecified complaints. Wouldn't say what they were. And they did this at the exact same time that some of the occupiers were talking to the Orlando City Council, asking them to not treat the protesters like petty criminals. Occupy New Orleans was ousted um, at 4 a.m. Uh, based on a claim, again, of health and safety issues. Is there anybody who is still going to claim that there's no coordination, that there's no script that's being used, no agreed-on procedures to be used, when overwhelmingly these raids happen in the middle of the night, overwhelmingly they involve massive numbers of the police, and overwhelmingly they refer to health and safety issues, often in those exact words. Does anybody really think there's no coordination here? When uh, the occupation in New Orleans was raided, the, the city cleanup crews basically swept up uh, uh, tents and other personal, uh, personal possessions and just dumped them into dump trucks. A couple of hours later, the mayor of New Orleans, his name is Mitch Landrieu, he had a press conference and he bragged about the success of the operation. And he said the protesters could come back. He said they can even come and pick at City Hall as long as they don't stay overnight. And I thought, well, isn't that nice of him? Isn't that nice of him to allow as how he would deign to grant them their most basic constitutionally protected rights? You can pick at City Hall. And provided, of course, that you then go home and disappear. Um, now, the thing is about this, less than 24 hours before this raid, the occupiers had filed in court um, for a, uh, a suit for a restraining order preventing the police from evicting them without notice. That hearing was set for that same morning. When it was asked, when the mayor was asked at his press conference why the city couldn't wait a few more hours to, to, to see what happened at the hearing, the mayor said, why? Why should we wait? Well, a few hours later, less than 12 hours after the raid, the court issued the restraining order, and the city has to let the encampment back in for at least another week until a full hearing can be held. So I'd like to see the mayor ask again, you know, are considering the outcome of the court hearing, explain to us again why after 62 days of occupation, the city could not wait a couple of more hours to see what the court said. Or was the opportunity to destroy some of the personal possessions of the occupiers just too tempting to resist? 
that really leaves basically Occupy DC and Occupy Boston as the two major occupations still going on. There are a number of smaller ones in smaller towns. Um, and they're probably still there because they were smart. DC occupiers got an injunction. They have to get at least 24 hours notice. Uh, the Boston occupiers also got an injunction. They had a hearing on December 1st, and that injunction was continued for another two weeks, so they're protected until December 15th. By the way, speaking of Boston, uh, the mayor of Boston, Tom Menino, gave some advice to the protesters. He said, pick one issue, as if there's only one issue that's of concern. Just pick one issue and take it to Washington. Or, to be more exact, Pick one issue. I don't care what it is. I don't care what you do, where you do it, as long as I don't have to deal with it. As long as you don't bother me. All right, what happens now? Uh, the Occupy phase of the Occupy movement uh, may be coming to an end. Um, so will the movement die? Some people, the Bill, I'm a, I'm a uh, professional idiot, O'Reilly, among them say that the movement's already dead. But as I've said many times, the issue is not the encampments. The issue is the visibility. And uh, other people are finding ways to be visible. There's an, there's an encampment on the National Mall in D.C. just for this week. And they're doing a little bit different. They're calling it the People's Camp. And they have units set up at the, uh, at the National Mall. But they don't camp there. They're there in the daytime. And they sleep in local churches. And they're going to be there for this week. There were hundreds of them lobbying Congress and sitting in and in uh, uh, the offices of various Congress people. Um, they're, they're going to, to K Street, which is where all the lobbyists are, to, uh, to go there to lobby the lobbyists. And uh, there's a plan for a uh, national, teach, uh, national prayer uh, service um, and uh, public speaking at the Capitol and a march. Now, more dramatic than that is the current move to, it's called Occupy Our Homes. This is where occupations are taking place in foreclosed homes to try to keep the family from being evicted. On Tuesday, this is December 6th I'm talking about, Tuesday, December 6th, such occupations occurred in at least 25 cities, including uh, Atlanta, Brooklyn, Chicago, Cleveland, Miami, Minneapolis, Oakland, Portland, St. Louis, San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, and Toledo, and also smaller places like um, Southgate, Minnesota, and Gwinnett County, Georgia. On December 12th, there is a plan to blockade entrances to seaports along the West Coast, just a one-day blockade. And on January 1st, some people plan to march as a human float alongside the Rose Bowl parade under the slogan, not everything is coming up roses. So is the movement dead? <laughs> no way. You want to know how you can know? Frank Luntz, this is the guy who advises Republicans on what words to use for the greatest public impact, said he is scared to death of the Occupy movement. Scared to death of it. And in fact, he encouraged Republicans to not use the word capitalism. Avoid that word. Um, Obama, Barack Obama just gave a speech where a lot of people commented it sounded like he was reading Occupy signs for his protest. Mario Cuomo, the governor of New York, had opposed the extension of a surtax on millionaires uh, an income surtax, he now changed his mind and wants that to continue. So, yeah, it's not dead, and it's having an impact. Um, and a couple of bits of other Occupy news. Uh, Jerry Nadler, he's the uh, congressman whose who's district includes Zuccotti Park in New York. He wants the Justice Department to investigate whether the New York Police Department commit, committed civil rights violations against the protesters whether their actions uh, were, um, uh, I'll actually, whether there in fact was police misconduct in violation of federal law and whether these actions were taken to prevent OWS protesters from exercising their First Amendment rights. Meanwhile, Frank LaRue, he is the United Nations Envoy for Freedom of Expression, said he is drafting an official communication to the U.S. government demanding to know why federal officials are not protecting the, uh, the rights of occupiers whose protests are being forcibly shut down. No, the movement is not dead. It's just adapting. All right, last thing. Last thing. I probably got about three or four minutes, I suspect. 
Four minutes. Good. I've said several times that um, the idea that businesses and rich people are the job creators is bogus, that the only thing that creates jobs is demand, demand for goods and services, because businesses will not hire people they don't need to meet demand. Well, it turns out I'm not the only one saying that. A number of economists are, and I was actually this uh, venture capitalist. His name is Nick Hanauer. He's not only part of the 1%, based on how he's described himself, he's part of the one-tenth of 1%. He wrote in Business Week this week, the conventional wisdom that the rich and businesses are a nation's job creators is false. He said if there's no investors or entrepreneurs, the economy doesn't grow. But without consumers, there are no investors and entrepreneurs, and only consumers can get that cycle going. Um, and I, I, one of the reasons I bring this up, I love this quote. He said, and this is quoting, when business people take credit for creating jobs, it is like squirrels taking credit for creating evolution. Now, very quickly, I wanna, uh, I'm going to try to do this very quickly. Um, an issue, got three minutes. Okay, the issue, uh, there's an issue that has divided progressives. Uh, the continuation of the payroll tax cut. The payroll tax, of course, is that portion of your wages that go to Social Security. Um, it had been 6.2% from you and from your employer. It's now 4.2% from you and 6.2% from your employer. Obama wants to cut both of those to 3.1%. Now, again, this has divided people. People talk about the stimulus effect and the effect of what will happen if it, if it uh, is not passed. I have to tell you, I'm against the extension. I'm against the extension. First, because the end of a temporary tax cut is not a tax increase. I don't care what, you call, what people say. It's not an increase. Saying it's an increase is like saying that your, your, your grocery store has a special on orange juice, and that ends on Friday, and you go in on Thursday and, and demand to know why they're raising the price of orange juice. It's a temporary cut. Um, the more important thing, though, is I think the stimulative effect of this, of this cut is actually very small. There's certainly no evidence of it this year. And the average effect has, uh, was about $1,000 a year, about $20 a week. For, for, this is for an average middle-class family, we're told. The further cut that Obama proposes would raise that to $1,500 a year or $30 a week. In other words, an additional $10 a week. I don't think that's going to cause a spending boom. And I think to the extent that people are aware of this increase, they're more likely to use it to pay down debt or to replenish savings they had to draw on before rather than going out and people are not going to go out and buy $1,500 of more stuff. But at the same time, by reducing the payroll tax, this undercuts Social Security, which is financed that way. Social Security lost out on $112 billion in income because of this cut. Now, the federal government made that up by borrowing money, which just increases the deficit, and that makes Social Security responsible for a part of the deficit in a way that it never has been before. Barack Obama has said that uh, he, he thinks cuts in Social Security are needed. This simply serves as a lever in order to enforce that. All right, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Uh, I'll have to see you next week. You just have the best week you can. Um, there'll be lots more stuff to talk about, I guarantee it, and hopefully have some happier stuff too. Have a great week.